everybody. I am Katie Dirkstra. I'm the Vice President of the NHRC, and I am going to be your moderator today. Before we start our presentation, I just wanted to let you know that our next event will be on June 9th. We're still trying to figure out if we're going to do virtual or in person. We're trying to do a combination of those this year. So we'll get that topic out to you later this week so that you're aware of it. And um, as always, we got a YouTube channel so that you can check out of our recordings of when we do have our virtual round tables in case you've registered and weren't able to watch our speaker today. So I want to do an introduction to Randall Widenar. He is a researcher, an author, a national speaker, and his passion was born out of the pain of broken workplaces and leaders that would rather, rather than serve. Randall is the creator of the VP culture. The leadership system is based on an attachment science. It inspires powerful, rational culture foundation. His research reveals our neurobiology engages our relationships and healthy connections. This is um, an awesome presentation today. If you have questions, please write them in the comments or wait until the end of the presentation and then we can have Randall answer all those questions. Randall, thanks so much for meeting with us today. Sure, thanks for having me. It's all, the, the stage is yours. Okay, great. All right, let's jump right in then. All right, so we're gonna talk about the one thing that motivates all people and that story, that story, let me get my slides rolling here. You can see them in the back there. There we go. That story starts here, okay? So let's just pretend that you've just walked in and, and, that, and you can tell that the, the, emotional, uh, the emotional current of, of this meeting is a little bit tense. You're already a little bit late. You come in and nobody's looking at you. And then the CEO, she's looking down as well. There's not the usual greeting with the eyes and things like that. So you're, you're wondering what's going on. And then the CEO looks at you and says, we've been waiting for you. The board is concerned about the turnover, the great resignation, our hiring, our workforce, all of that. And they think culture is the key. And so what's your plan for the culture? We're looking for HR to lead this one. And what do you say in that moment? Do you have the plan already ready? Can you, can you lay it down in front of them and inspire them with scientific methodologies and, and business cases for why it works and, and scientific stories behind what goes on behind the scenes with your leadership. So that's what this seminar is gonna do for you in the next hour is give you all those tools so that when you face this kind of a meeting, you'll be set. So let's dive deeper. So the one question that I've been having my entire life is this, my research life is, is this, what is the one thing that motivates all people? Okay. What is the one thing that motivates all people? And I think that would be the, the key to any great culture is to knowing the answer to this question. So I've been asking this question wherever I go. And let me crank up the chat here because you guys get, get to participate a little bit here. And so open up your chat screen. And uh, the question is, what do your employees think top of their head that motivates them to come to work or to take that job with you guys? What's, what's the, what are some of the things? Write that in the chat. What are some of the things that you hear the average person say, and all culture, what else? People, purpose and money, team. So yeah, those are a lot of the things that I hear when I, when I speak around the world to, to different people and get a picture as to what's going on. So I hear money, I hear enjoyment, I hear acceptance of the big dream. So enjoying uh, just a, a mishmash of the different things that you guys have already said. So these are the things I typically hear when I talk around the, around the nation. So what we're gonna do in the next few minutes is we're gonna test some of this out. So we're gonna do a work experiment here. You guys didn't know this for, for the rest hour. I'm gonna have you virtually pumping water. So if, uh, you know, Katie said that I, I can give you an extra penny a pump here. And if you do this, you'll get 35 bucks for this entire hour. So for the next hour, let's see how much that penny a pump is gonna motivate you. And I also have this secret thing that I've installed in your computer, a virus that, that will tell you <laughs> how, how, how motivated you guys are. Okay, you're doing okay? Oh, you've <laughs> given up. And, and that's typically the thing. Money is not the primary motivator for people. The data suggests that once people are paid fairly, it no longer becomes a big issue. They'll look around and see whether the statistics around them are similar to what their case is, both for their job and the geography. And if it is, and it's fair, 
they're happy to work for those kind of those kind of uh, labor prices. So money is usually not the motivator. It might get them into a job or get them started, but it's not going to keep them going long term, just as it didn't keep you guys going long term for a penny a pump. So what else have we got here? So let's look at the next slide here. Excuse me, my slide, my slide advancer is a little bit slow today. So we'll look at the next concept, enjoyment. This guy's obviously enjoying the nice haircut. This is Andre Agassi. He gets to play a game for a job. So what, what could be wrong with that? I mean, in fact, he, he shows up to work and he's got 10,000 fans going, he's here, he's here, Andre. What's not to enjoy about that? You know, he gets to being a little ball across the net. And not only that, he's really good at it. He's number one in the entire entire world you know he's he's won the u.s open the french open the australian open the open open if he's open if it's openable he opened it he won the olympics he was number one in the world for years and years so he had this to say about his life and enjoying all of this he says let me let you into a little secret he said winning changes nothing he said how could i be number one in the world play a game for a job have a my own plane and a bank full of money married to Brooke Shields and still be unhappy. In fact, he went into a downward spiral when he realized enjoyment is not enough to propel you through your life in your workplace. He was taking methamphetamines. He started cascading down. He was throwing his racket at the judge and yelling and screaming. He ended up in the amateur leagues at the bottom of the barrel. His life was a wreck. When, when enjoyment doesn't fuel your life, what does? Well, let's look at this next thing, the big dream. This is me back when I had hair and a big dream. And I'm 18 years old, 19 years old. And I was thinking, I was a really good artist at the time. My mom was an artist. I inherited her skills. And I thought, I'll be an artist. I'll, I'll go to art school. But then I thought, no, I could do something bigger. I want a bigger dream. I want to change the world, of course. And so I had this big, passionate dream that I wanted to accomplish, something that would, that would be very purposeful, and so I was going to go to a foreign country, work with refugees, change that country for the better and see what I could do. So that was my big dream. And my daughter, Ashley, she had a similar dilemma. She came to me and she's, she's even better than me. She inherited my art skills, my mother's art skills. She was an art major. She was crushing it. And, but she came to me, I don't know if you guys have uh, kids in college, but they came to that, that, that freshman syndrome at the end of the year, like, I don't think I can do this for the rest of my life. And she was in tears. So it was, it was that serious angst of what's my life going to look like? But I was able to tell her, you know, I was in the same situation. I had the art skills. I was headed to art skills, but I chose to do something bigger. So I told her about this story, my story. My story started here with my big dream in Athens, Greece. And I was with a team and the, the leader I was with had good intentions to make us all work together and to accomplish big stuff and change the nation as well. But I was driving down this street one day. This is the actual Marathon Street that connects Marathon Greece with Athens. It's the first one where that first marathon runner was running for his life to tell the king of Athens that they had just accomplished the big dream. They had just defeated the superpower of the world and protected their entire city. But he died at the end of that run because he had run so hard. And I was dying as I drove down this street just a mere three months after I had started this job. And you know how when you're in your car and you have all the doors shut, you could just yell and scream where I put my visor down and was just screaming and yelling in despair because in three short months, my dream met this manager and my, my dream died, it was crushed. Because in, while we were feeding poor out in the streets, we were having shame shoved down our throats at every staff meeting. You guys aren't doing enough. You're not staying up late enough. You're not raising enough money. When I was urinase, I was doing the same work in jungles and you're in some European city and this is easy. Come on guys, I was up till three o'clock in the morning last night. What were you doing? It was never enough. And my dream and that shame crushed me as a young 20 year old. And I left that place uh, disillusioned. And I'm not alone. There's a crisis all over the nation. What do we tell the 30-year-olds the that come to us, the 20-year-olds? What do we say? Yeah, this is the meaning of work. I hope you find it. I, I, here's what's going to motivate you through this job. We've got very enjoyable place. We've got very purposeful work. We've got great benefits. Is that going to be enough to motivate people their entire lives? What do we tell them? What do I tell my daughter, Ashley? In fact, the average team shows like, up like this. Three of them are pulling hard. 
according to Gallup, if there was 10 altogether, the three, these are the engaged employees according to Gallup. And then you've got five that are just kind of hanging onto that rope if they're pulling at all. When the boss shows up, they pull a little bit. When he's gone, you know, a little bit of Facebook, a little bit of, and then they're disengaged. They're not giving it their all. And then there's the two that are just like, oh, fun with this job. These people stinks. My, mas my manager is horrible. Why would you want to work here? They're disgruntled, okay? So you've got 70% of the workforce in that crisis point of, I don't know why I'm working and I'm not motivated. In fact, 50% of these are always looking for new jobs because they think the grass is going to be greener somewhere else. So this is what those statistics look like. 51% looking for new jobs. Let me highlight one day a week lost per employee in productivity. Might as well just go home on Friday. That's how much productivity is lost because people are just hanging onto that rope, disengaged or disgruntled. And then there's Gen Z, 75% have quit for emotional issues. What, you know, they've only been in the workforce for like six, six months, what do they know? Or maybe they haven't given up on finding something that's really meaningful and working in their lives. So what do we tell, what do we tell them? What's the dilemma of this workforce? How do, we, how do we confront that? And since in my research, I didn't really find in those three areas something that really motivates people deeply, I, I decided to change the questions slightly, okay? from what motivates everyone to work because I found that people were answering it with their left brains and they were calculating. Yeah, maybe that'd be enough money. Maybe that'd be an enjoyable enough task. I could do that for a long time. But when I changed the question, the right brain answers the question differently. So this is how I've changed the question as a researcher. Ready? If you could choose just one thing for all eternity, what would you choose? So you, could you get to take one thing from this earth that motivates you into through a sci-fi portal into the into the eternity and it has to motivate you forever so it's a big ask of this one thing so i push out those things that we that universally kind of get pushed forward in my comments you get money alone okay you could be on amazon all day long buying whatever you want but that's all you get it's just stuff and money or you could have enjoyment alone you get to pick one game that you get to play for all eternity and i hope it I hope it works for you. I hope it keeps in giving you enjoyment for all eternity. Or you get to build one big dream. You get to paint that beautiful painting. You get to compose the perfect symphony. You get to build the nonprofit that you've always wanted. But that's all you get is to build that one dream alone for all eternity. Or I give you number four. You could be surrounded by those who care and value you for all eternity. What would you choose? So jump in the chat. Tell us one, two, three, or four. What would you vote? What would you vote if these were the four choices you were given for all eternity? Number four. Four, four, hands down. Of course, when I, when I give this in, in front of a live audience, I was just in Kalamazoo speaking to 180 people. They all just like, it's number four. And I had them all stand up if that's what they chose. And everyone stands up in the whole crowd. Why is that? Why is this universally something that we all respond to of being valued and valuing people. It's the one thing that motivates all people. I can get CEOs, welders, factory workers, office workers, everyone to agree that this is the thing that I would want more than anything else in the whole world. And it could motivate me for all eternity. It would never stop. There's a lot of reasons why this is true. This is the one thing that we all want. And I can show this to people quickly. It's universal. It's not just, like I said, it's all different types of genders, ethnicities, groups, cultures. They all agree on this. And the reason why our right brain knows this, and they know it, it knows it immediately. You didn't have to think, well, let me consider that. It's because it ignites our bodies and our brains. Our body, our right brain just knows that that's the right answer. And we'll get into that deeper later on in the talk. But scientists, scientists have gone all over the world and asking people, what is the one thing that motivates you? And over 7,000 respondents from different countries around the world, over 41 different countries around the world, said that this is the thing that motivates them more than anything else. So it's a universal truism that this is the thing that motivates all people. I call it the, the operating system of culture because this is the very foundation of humanity. This is the one thing that motivates us. So we need to build our cultures on this thing. It's the operating system that our cultures run on. So that brings us to this dilemma. 
Well, if everybody kind of knows this, if Randall can stand up in front of a crowd and get them all to recite the same thing in about five minutes of his talk, why is it that 70% of people don't feel it, aren't seeing it? That's because we have this commodity culture that most of our cultures are built on. Most organizations come around getting some sort of task together or making some sort of product and people can't get out of their minds and the, the leaders are leading towards those tasks and those products and people think, I'm just a cog to create that product. I'm just a means to this end versus VP culture, which is valuing people culture, where this culture, this organization is all about valuing people, valuing the people that we give the service and product to, valuing our teams, valuing ourselves as individuals. And we'll look at how we create that. But first, we'll go down this path and explore how we got there. Well, this commodity culture is built on stimulus and response of of behavioralism that started in the 50s when management science began, so did this science. And people thought, well, you know, if I just give somebody a reward, they'll go jump through the hoop. If I give them a, a, a punishment, that'll make them go through the hoop even faster. So both of those things, and they tested it scientifically, and you know what? It works. It works, gets people to goals and rewards pretty, pretty well, but the problem, it works temporarily. And Paul Marciano, PhD, wrote this book, Carrots and Sticks Don't Work. So he talked about how building a culture based on this behavioralist model actually diminishes personal value, diminishes the culture, diminishes outcomes. So, but the problem is, is it works temporarily. And this is what's taught and what is easily caught. It's an easy tool to use, and that's what most people move towards. Okay, but the problem is it needs increasing stimulus. If you give a reward this week, it needs to be twice as much that this week. And then what about the other guys? They didn't get their reward and they feel behind it, behind everything else. They don't feel valued in their culture because they didn't get the reward, but they worked hard, didn't they? People are a means in this kind of culture, not an end. They're not the point of the culture and it ultimately destroys value. And what's going on inside of our brain? So we'll, we'll, take, the, we'll take a stroll down the the neuroscience pathways every once in a while, just to get a bigger picture of what's going inside inside of our brain. So there's this molecule called dopamine, which fuels your brain when you're in this pathway of desire, of getting things done, okay? So it's, I gotta move towards stuff. I gotta move towards this. I gotta get this reward. And then you boom, a reward signal is, is triggered in your brain called dopamine. But this is a unique one and it's designed to move us towards goals and, and goods. And uh, it's all about desire, but not value. It triggers feeling good about desiring something. It doesn't feel good like, oh, I've got it. That's not the feeling because it goes away. It's down-regulated. That's a, a, you know how, this is why addicts who take drugs like cocaine that stimulate, artificially stimulate dopamine beyond anything that can happen in normal life, they feel high, they, they desire things, they want more, they want more of that cocaine. It desires that pathway. So they take more of it, more of it, more of it, more of it, because the brain keeps down regulating it. The first hit was good, but it's not enough. You need more and more and more and more until that addict is fueled by a desire for that. And they, they leave their family behind. They leave their health behind. They leave their finances behind and they become addicted and it destroys their life. It's a very destructive cycle to overuse this dopamine cycle or to have it underused. It's a destructive use in the human, human being and human culture. Factor, Dr. Robert Lustig, he wrote this book, The Hacking of the American Mind, okay? He says, we're, we've been hacked by dopamine. And, you know, marketers and entrepreneurs have figured out that, that we can hack our electronics, we can hack our, our entertainment, we don't have to actually value the person. We can just jack up their brain and get them to do things. We seek to use stuff to replace human value. We seek to use novelty to replace human connection. They've hacked our food. Every Dorito has been engineered so that it has the right amount of salt, the right amount of fat, the right amount of sugar, the right amount of carbohydrates, just so that you can't stop eating it, that you get a dopamine hit for more and more and more. Eventually, you're like, I don't want to eat any more of this bag, but I can't stop. So you just do because it's been hacked for that. Our electronics, you know, everything is, you know, just one more surprise, one more surprise. TikTok is one more surprise, one more surprise, and you just can't stop. It looks like something happened to the video here. 
One second. Let me get this fixed here. All right, back online here. Sorry about that. All right, so talking about electronics. So we've got entertainment. Like it used to take us uh, 10 years to walk to all the friends or ER, and now our kids can watch it in a weekend. They just binge watch it. They just can't stop. They can't stop. And I own a marketing company. And so often, marketing companies are designed to get us to, to move towards that next thing, that next thing, that next thing. So we've been hacked by this dopamine pathway. And unfortunately, our leadership is using it too. So, you know, our leaders found this easy, easy way to hack our minds and hack the people that we're working with and not because they're evil, they're good intention. They want to people get people through the work that they need to do. It's just an easy pathway to go down. And, but the problem, there's a side effect, cortisol, stress. That's what affects us in this pathway. The punishment reward cycles are stressors for us and the reward is limited. So there's, there's, uh, a limited amount of it. So we're not sure if we're gonna get the quantities we need and do it well enough. We're not gonna be the employee of the week. So we, we start to let go. You're not valuable, stuff is. Can cause illnesses and 42.1% of all absences are actually caused by this kind of side effect of this dopamine pathway that we're pushing people down. And in fact, presenteeism is 1.5 times worse. The people that actually don't take the day off and they show up at work, just slow down 1.5 times more than the persons that take the day off and recoup and come back in the next day. So here's your brain. It's more brain science. So we have this highest form of our brain, the cortex, and then there's the limbic system and the diencephalon and the brain stem. The cortex is, is your values, your creativity, your future vision of the world. And then it's connected to your limbic system, which is the emotional center, which perceives danger or opportunity, danger or opportunity. And then it, it, it engages with the, the diencephalon, which regulates your brain. It sends out hormones and energy and glucose so that you can take care of whatever the limbic system wants you to do, run away or embrace a, a new idea and, and get excited about it. And then there's the brainstem, which is just trying to keep you alive. You know, keep your, give enough oxygen, enough sugar in your blood, enough salt in your blood, and just keeping you alive. So what happens? Well, Dr. Bruce Perry said that this is state dependent. So if you feel valued, your whole brain can, can, can engage because the cortex is creative. The limbic system says it's positive. So it engages the diencephalon and survival things. And it all leads towards high level of functioning. You want your employees in this state. And that's the, the three people they're pulling full are feeling valuable and, and are bringing that to work. And then when you go down the spectrum from there into alert, alarm, fear, terror, the limbic system starts perceiving that danger, not opportunity. And so it starts to alert the entire body to start shutting off the cortex, get into survival mode, release all those hormones like cortisol and stress hormones so that we can combat what's coming on in life. And what that does is it actually lowers our intelligence from maybe 120 down to 80. The military won't even hire anybody down at this level because they don't, they can't train them to do a single process. That's because Imagine if you've created that by your leadership, by creating more alarm and terror and fear, danger signals with the dopamine cycle into their lives. So what happens is dopamine and cortisol downregulate the system. So you have less intelligent employees, less engaged employees, stressed out employees because of the culture. It's the emotional current that is created by your leadership that causes this. So it's the emotional current of, of culture causes you to go from value to perhaps down into fear, okay? So that's what happens to our brain when we, we have a culture that's a commodity culture. We end up with no, feeling no value as an individual, okay? When we're just brought in to do a purpose, to do a job, to create a commodity, create a service, and we're not engaged with, with the leadership and the other team members, we have this commodity culture and we feel this no value. But what happens when we go down the other pathway, the VP culture, the valued people culture pathway? What does that look like? 
Okay. Well, this too started in the 1950s with a theory called attachment theory. Okay. And Dr. John Bowlby was somebody who, who started this theory. And he was looking into the, how children were affected at first. He was, he was a, he was a medical doctor. And, and in England at the time in the 50s, parents would bring their kids into the, into the hospital and they would let them sit there. And then like good English parents, they would say goodbye to Johnny and they would walk away. And Johnny wouldn't do so well. It would take Johnny weeks and months to recover. And he'd spend you know, a long time in the hospital. Whereas some odd English parents would, would bring Johnny in and they'd make sure to visit every day and stay as long as they could. And that Johnny would thrive. He would get better quickly and be out of the hospital very quick. And so Dr. Bowlby started noticing that that human attachment affected our physiology, affected their brains, and he started studying it. And over years and years, he found out that it happened from childhood to adulthood. And it's now become the primary psychological theory as to what motivates us, what drives us. It's human connection. It's attachment with other people, from parents to family, to coworkers, to society. And they've written these huge books about adult attachment. And they have sections in here about work and how work attachment affects us in our day-to-day -day lives. Those who have it thrive. Those who don't are, are, uh, have diminishing returns because our brain is tuned by valuing. Our brain is always searching for that human connection. That previous slide, when we see that human connection of valuing, we move forward. And if we don't, we bucker down. So in the valuing proposition, this is what it looks like. Inside your brain, instead of that dopamine, you get serotonin. And you guys all know what that feels like because you all chose it when you chose number four, when you chose, I want to be valued by people for all, all, all of eternity. Because why? What does serotonin do in our brains? It gives us contentment and safety. So that contentment is, yeah, I know it lasts forever. It doesn't just like, I win a game and they go, woo, but then it disappears. I know being valued can persist forever because I felt it. And not only that, gives me a contentment of safety, of, of goodness. I can go forward in life. I can do things. I feel okay. I'm energetic. It's a great state of being. And that's what serotonin does. It, in fact, there's this longevity study that Harvard did and started in the 1920s on a cohort of 381 people. And it's gone through those many decades and they've studied those people and saw just like that little Johnny in the hospital, how well did these people do over a lifetime? It's the longest study ever conducted like this. And guess what? The people that had those thriving, healthy, connected relationships, they did well in all measures. Their finances were good. Their health was good. Their careers went well. Their families grew up and were thriving. On all levels, they were connected and, and thriving. So it's based on the serotonin and the connection and being valued in their life. It's a signal to thrive. It's an, it's a, it's that signal that everything is good and your body starts ratcheting up the power. It's the ma master modulator, okay? So just like dopamine kind of pushes things down and keeps you there, serotonin actually goes into every cell of your body and upregulates and says, hey, it's time to come alive. Hey, it, it's time to get going. Hey, things are good. We, we've turned on the energy, turn on the lights. Let's, let's start going. Life is worth living. Literally, it's a modulator that that changes the long-term state of your nervous system, your brain, and your body. And that's why cultures in this kind of environment thrive because you're, that's what you're creating on a molecular level on every human being's body. And economist, Dr. Paul Zak, who wrote this book, wanted to know what was going on in, in people's brains. And he found out that oxytocin and human connection all of these things were, were the basis of trust in economies. And he did test after test. And he said, human connection is the basis of, of, of the economic world. It's the foundation of trust in business. He said, had this to say. He said, there are no shortcuts or substitutes. Success is great, but no amount of money or achievement will, or fame will satisfy our need for human attachment. So it's the basis of economy. And then it starts helping us thrive because our brains release these endocannabinoids and endogenous opioids. Those are big words for pot and heroin. Your brain releases that naturally. That's why we have receptors for those in our brain. And it's supposed to be released in cases when you have great human relationships. 
This one says, you know, it calms you down and it lowers your pain threshold, makes you feel great, euphoric. And that's why lonely people often seek to calm their bodies down with the, with the exogenous, the, the drugs from the outside to, to calm their bodies, to, to sort of replace that feeling. In fact, one in 25 Americans don't have a single person that they can call a friend in this world. That's why we have this epidemic of opioids and cannabinoid abuse. It's, it's because people are looking for, for that receptor that's supposed to be released in VP kind of cultures. In fact, it's not just the, the chemicals that change in your brain, it's the electrical systems. This guy, Stephen Porges, he's famous in the psychology world for this polyvagal theory, which basically he studied the 10th cranial nerve called the vagus nerve. And basically he called it the social connection circuit. It seems like a, a weird name for a nerve in our system, but he, he noticed the same pattern. When we are socially engaged, when we're properly surrounded by those who value us, electrical systems come alive. This nerve is connected to your brain and then it's connected to your heart and to your lungs and your vital organs, nothing important inside of you. And it sends signals to, for all of those things to operate at optimal levels. Why? When? When you're feeling valued. So your electrical system, your chemical systems, everything in your neurological, biological system has this positive energetic feeling of what's going forward. So instead of having this downward force a pressure of dopamine and cortisol, we have this upward force of serotonin that leaves us up here, lets our whole brain function and function well. And our whole intelligence comes to work and our whole world starts functioning better. In fact, if you start out with that com uh, commodity culture, you're gonna be dopamine driven goals, get it done, money, stuff. And then maybe you have a little bit of, yeah, we got a little people stuff on the side, this little serotonin corner, we'll do some of that. But the do dominant culture is this dopamine culture. What happens over time? Well, they're both downregulated. Over time, both become smaller. You get less results over time. You get less out, fewer outcomes. You get people leaving. You get disconnection over time. But if you start out with a even a moderate, moderate amount of so serotonin and your, some of your dopamine, dopamine is not a bad thing. It, we, we want to accomplish goals, but we want to value people first. What happens in the long run? Well, serotonin becomes huge and dopamine gets bigger too. So you have this win-win situation where you accomplish your goals when you value people first, not when you put goals first, everything diminishes. So it's, it's a great irony that we've used this other system. So when we create this VP culture, people are gonna be feeling valued. That's the primary question. Teach your leaders to value others, okay? So I often get at this point, uh, Randall, that, that's all great soft skills stuff, but this is business. This is about bottom line, dog eat dog. Somebody's got to win, somebody's got to lose. So what I always do is bring them to this case study. This is Southwest Airlines and they're a great pick for this particular um, business case because they have this heart on all of their planes. So they've, they've got a singular culture that they've had since the beginning of their time that they valued people first. Always. Their CEO, Herb Kelleher, was committed to that beyond all else. Okay. But did they make financial success out of this or was this just wishful thinking? Well, they're also great because they started behind the eight ball financially. So they started in the 19, 50 years ago when other airlines were already mature in the industry and they wouldn't let them into the mainline, you know, ticketing electronic system. They wouldn't let them fly point to hub and then change planes in Chicago and fly on to another location like most big airlines do. No, they had to fly from small airport to small airport and they had to hustle, they had to charge less so they couldn't make as much money. They had charged less, they had less capitalization and they had a 20% 20, 20 less efficient route. So if they can make money doing this, they'd have to be magicians or have something else going on. So what did they do in the past 20 years? Well, they've had 50 years of profitability. You think, well, it's an airline, they're always profitable. No, the airline industry has posted a net loss in those 50 years. This is the only airlines that has been profitable for 50 years throughout recessions and downturns. They have more stock value than all the others. They have the most productive employees. And you're thinking, well, they probably just aren't unionized. That's why. No, they're actually the most unionized labor force in all of the airlines. They just work better together because they value everyone. 
They have the lowest turnovers, almost no layoffs. They have the highest record safety record. They have the highest satisfaction record. And they're the largest airlines in the United States. Amazing after 50 years. And you think, well, maybe you're just cherry picking, Randall. Maybe that's not really what the, the people close to the scenario understand. Well, let's ask Herb Kelleher, the former CEO, what his analysis is. And he says this, for those who think that leading with love is simply soft management, review the record of Southwest Airlines over the last 50 years. And from those results, it can factually and logically be concluded that if you seek long and continued success for your business organization, treat your people as family and lead with love. A CEO of a successful 50 year long business. And you think, well, maybe you're cherry picking again. Really, It's just, you know, just a, a unicorn that did that once. Well, let's look at the trillion dollar coach. This is Bill Campbell. He was the CEO of this little company called Intel. You may have heard of them. And then when he retired, he decided to become an executive coach for another couple of small guys, Jeff Bezos, Steve Jobs, Eric Schmidt, the CEO of Google. You know, he was coaching over a trillion dollars worth, worth of business as their executive coach. And there was one thing above all else that these three people remember that Bill Campbell impressed upon them to be and to do. And that was this, that Bill valued people. In fact, whether he was in the boardroom or whether he was, he was sometimes out coaching powder puff football because he loved to do that. So here's Bill, he's on the field and, and, and there, he'd be coaching eight-year-old girls on the, on the, on the football field. And, well, look, Steve Jobs is calling me up. Look, girl, Steve Jobs, boop, voicemail. Okay, what's next? because he was present for them. He was valuing them. He valued Steve Jobs too, but whoever was with him, he was teaching all of those executives that it was important to value every person you're with. So that was the key that, that this trillion dollar coach brought to the fore. And here are the examples of, of Gallup's research of not just one company, but meta research of, uh, of I think of over 35,000 different companies of millions of employees. It's 37% more in turnover lower turnover, lower safety problems, 41% fewer defects, 21% higher productivity, 22% higher profits, 11% higher stock value. So the numbers always follow the, the percentage of valuing people. As valuing people increases, the numbers, the finances increase because it makes the difference. All things being equal, those who value people more will succeed more. So it's the secret ingredient that these people lacked this is over 77 different bankruptcies that happened during those 50 years during the ascendancy of Southwest Airlines with uh, their VP culture that propelled them to succeed. Were these 77 others? They didn't have that secret sauce in a competitive, like we said, the airlines business is super competitive. You needed that extra in order to succeed and very few had it. So if you're, your business and your organization is wondering, how do we take it to the next step? Can the finances actually follow a valuing people culture? It definitely does. And we don't, we avoid it at our, at our own peril. So what are we looking at here? How do we create this VP culture? Usually my HR directors are all like, yeah, we're, we're, you're preaching in the choir here. We were, we were with you like 10 slides ago. So um, the, the key is this that so many of the people that I talk to, so many of the HR people after I talk, they come up to me and I ask them, do you have a plan? Just like I did at that, that, that opening slide, do you have a written plan for culture? And oftentimes I get this, well, no, we don't. We're, we're busy doing other things, but I have all these intentions, all of these desires for our great culture. So what I'm gonna show you in the next few minutes is, is the super quick methodology, the super quick plan that you need to develop. I'll show you the three pathways that you need to construct in your organization. But the number one thing, of course, is that you have a single destination. So many people think culture is this confusing thing. No, it's one thing. Are you valuing people? If your leaders make every decision about what values people, they're gonna be going in the right direction. So that's the key navigation point. When people say, oh, our culture is going over there to that value point, and it's going over there to that, and it's going over that, and we're making money your leaders are going everywhere. No, make it singular. When we value people, everything else will get in order. So that's the key. Have that one singular target of creating a VP culture where people are valued. But how do you do that? What's the key? What's the secret? Well, there's three practices that you need to develop. 
And these are the three practices. Personality science leads towards valuing people. Emotional science leads towards valuing people in the present. And this leads, value science leads towards valuing people in the future. All three, past, present, and future, are valuing people. And they're, they're te teaching your leaders the skills to value people. So let's dive in. Let's look at personality science. How does that lead towards valuing people? Well, imagine if you were trying to value somebody, but you didn't know what their personality was. You didn't even know what their DNA was. It'd be really hard. But when you do, they'll become 70% more engaged because I'm leading them to them. I'm not taking notes and going, well, at your, uh, your, your evaluation time, I noticed that you weren't extroverted. Well, duh, I'm not an extrovert. I, I noticed that you weren't open to new ideas. Well, no, that's not my personality trait either. I, I noticed that you were just concerned about what people thought. Well, that is part of what my personality is moving towards. That's very important to me. Yeah, but that was bad. And you can see when you're not led to your strengths, that leads to demoralization and, and disengagement. Well, you just don't know me. But when you do feel known and understood, according to the 30, research, 30 years of research uh, into personality structures, people get engaged. This is the most widely studied and, and scientifically validated social science, part of social science that there is out there. In fact, it's called a law of psychology. It's one of the few laws of psychology. When you've studied psychology, you'll know that there's a lot of disagreement, but on this one platform of what is the DNA of personality, it works in all ethnicities, all genders, all ages, it's universal. And this is the essence of it. It's to be known and understood. In your past, from my past, I know and understand myself and I'm known and understood by my leadership, okay? People don't know themselves. In fact, most time HR uses this, this type of personality tests to exclude people from jobs that they wouldn't like. No, you're an extrovert. You wouldn't like working in that cubicle by yourself. No, you're, you're very agreeable, which means you'd be great in customer service, but not great in sales. So all of these different factors, people don't know themselves enough to even take a job that they would actually enjoy and love. Think about this. Here's a little quiz for your culture. How many of your top leaders can actually name the five factors of personality? Five words, do they know them? So that shows you how teachable this skill is to teach them what five factors are, but most leaders go through all of their business schools and are never taught the very fundamental building blocks of every personality okay, that's in the world. It gives people superpowers because it, it gives them the ability to accept differences as good. Like instead of going, well, you're an, you're an extrovert and I'm an introvert. Well, you need to be more extroverted. Well, the introvert has powers that that extrovert doesn't have, okay? So it start, you start to see your, good, your, your powers as good. Like, you're really interested in, in new things, aren't you? Yes, I love new things. But this person on the other end of the spectrum likes to do the same thing over and over again. You could see how you need both in the business world. Keep doing that routine well and be happy about it. Keep learning new things and finding new things like research, you know, and then sports staff. Boy, you need them both. Okay, so you can predict how people are perceiving things. Like when you were to say to that, that new software launch, hey, we got new HR software. And you, you have three people on your team are like, oh no, terrified. And the other ones are gonna be like, wow, something new. We've been longing for something new. Those guys will dive in and the other ones will be terrified. Literally the same news point will cause two different perceptions. Predict behavior. We talked a little bit about that. So one person will like this job. Another person will, will thrive in that job. So. Being able as your leaders, as your leadership in HR, we do this all the time. We use these tools to help predict where people should fall in the workplace, what seat they'd be happy in. But your line leaders, your leaders all across your company need to know this and be able to be very fluent with your team as to how this works. And they, again, will be 70% more engaged. So imagine if you can raise your level, level of engagement by 70% by one practice, it's this one here. So. If you're introverts in, out there, I ask you to, to type chats in the chat, type me. And oftentimes I ask them, do extroverts treat you like you're an extrovert? Is, is the reward always, hey, we're gonna do something all together. Instead of like, just go home, be by yourself. Here's a bottle of wine, enjoy the peace and quiet, <laughs> okay? So you, me out there, do extroverts teach you, treat you often like an extrovert? 
I'm guilty of that. I'm an extrovert and I, my wife is an introvert. And I always thought, you know, you know, that she was just a broken extrovert and that she'd get over it someday until I wrote, read Susan Cain's book about the, uh, the, the, the quiet, uh, soup, quiet power of introverts. And, I, and every chapter I'm looking at my wife going, I'm so sorry, you're not broken. I'm so sorry, you're actually great. I'm so sorry, you're not. And our whole world is geared around extroverts and we don't even know how to treat introverts at all. So that's just one instance of where there's a disconnect in personality and how it, pe it affects people. So imagine that every single team leader knew every single person on their team. How would they feel? What emotional current would he create in the culture of his team? Those people would feel valued. They would feel known and understood and that they would be valued for the, for the positive things that they bring. So let's go on to the next one, emotional science. That's about being valued in the present. How do we value people in the present? How do we connect with them? Amy Edmondson did this experiment in, uh, in the Boston area, okay? She was looking, she had this theory that emotionally safe teams will have better outcomes than non-emotionally safe teams. So she, she gave the standardized test to find out if they're emotionally safe or not. And then she, she followed those teams around to see what the results are. And you know what she found? She found that the emotionally safe teams had worse outcomes. She's like, wait, that's not right. The emotionally unsafe teams had all these great statistics. She's like, wait, that, that blows my whole theory. But then she looked at her, her research methodology and they were self-reporting the results. So she sent a, a secret reporter behind there to record all the actual results unbeknownst to the other teams and found out that statistics were actually reversed. The, science, the, the psychologically safe teams, the emotionally safe teams had better quality outcomes but they were free to actually report their errors. The, science, the emotionally unsafe teams could never report an error. So all they reported was success, 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 success. So in essence, they were lying on all of their reports. These are ethical people who work with people, nurses, doctors. Amazing that you can get those people to do ethical lapses because of a psychologically unsafe team. That's the power of that emotional current that your culture creates. In the emotionally safe current, people could flourish, do better, and actually report the truth. In the emotionally unsafe current, people had to hide, swim for their lives, and even lie to protect themselves. Incredible. So he, she found it's the number one factor in success. Even Google, Google found that out. And oftentimes, uh, Early management theory said, you know, we just need to hide or banish our emotions. So we need to hide behind the smiley face of how's everything? Good. How are your how are your outcomes? Good. You see how it works? Though someone is smiling when you show up in their face, behind all of these emotions are, are actually going on inside their body and they can't be dispelled. So how do we create this emotional safety? Since it's great, it's a great thing to, that leads towards a great emotional current of a culture within your in, in your organization. We use this one approach by, given by uh, Stephen Hayes. He's the author of this book, A Liberated Mind. And how does it get liberated? Well, it gets liberated being pushed around by emotions. So in, instead of uh, having an emotional event come in like, oh no, they're, I just had a negative outcome. Oh, hide it. It can go, boy, that's an emotionally dangerous thing, but I can absorb that and move on towards my own values. So ACT, which is his approach, has been studied in the workplace for over 30 years. So it's highly validated. And it gives you perspective on emotions, not control over emotions. Big difference. We're not teaching people to control everything and shut everything down. We're teaching people to have perspective and then be able to decide where they go from there. It's not reactive. Most people are very reactive to their emotions. In an unsafe current, you have to react to them. The leader is reacting. And so all of the team becomes reactive and, and feels danger. So this gives us freedom to act out of our values, to move, move into that future mode of like, where do we really want to go? So we'll look at what that looks like. It's about operating in the present. Can your leaders operate in the present, assess the emotional current, and, and give people the power, empower people to, to actually lead into this? So can your leaders do this? So here's an exercise that is often given by an ACT. It's called the hands exercise. So imagine emotions are actually this product of, of, of thought, 
what am I thinking? And what is my body feeling? So you get an email from your boss that says, come to my office. The thought is, oh no, that could be bad. The bodily feeling is, oh, my heart is beating really fast. You put them together and it spells fear. And that gets up in your face and you can't see anything. You have no perspective. And so you just say, I'm gonna blame my boss. I'm gonna blame, I'm gonna blame my coworkers. I'm gonna blame uh, marketing. It's their fault. The vendor did it, the vendor did it. And then you have all these excuses, but what if you could pull back and your leaders could have perspective and they can go, wow, that thought that my boss says come into my office, it might mean something else. It might be bad. And my heart is beating because that scared me when I got that email. I'm not sure what it means. I still don't know, but I'm gonna take a little perspective here and what's it like for me to do? Well, I'm not gonna to react to this emotion. I'll give myself five minutes before I go in there, calm down. And if there's something bad, I'll just act like me. I'll, I'll just continue to do the good. I'll continue to work hard. I'll continue to overcome any problems. You walk in there and your boss says, oh, I've got some leftover ticks from sales. Hope you could use them. And you're like, huh, thanks. <laughs> I was really freaked out at first. He, and if he's sensitive, he could say, well, probably I should have told you the tickets thing right up the front. I shouldn't just say, just come into my office. So he could perceive the, the cultural current he was making. So people think these two lies here. They think that they can control their brains, control every thought and control their bodies. So the first experiment I lead people through is 30 seconds. If you can control your thoughts, don't think for the next 30 seconds. All ready? Go. One. All right, anybody not think for 30 seconds? Do we have any super gurus say, yes, me. I didn't, I didn't think for 30 seconds. I was able to turn off my brain. Usually I, I, I might get one, but usually nobody can pass this test, okay? Nobody could shut off their brain for 30 seconds. Okay, you can't stop your thoughts because 90% of your brain is actually thinking for you and only 10% is perceiving. So you need to realize that that's the, the, the reality of your brain. Now, here's the other one I show people. I, I tell them to stand on their toes and then you'll notice me start like losing my balance, but going back and forth, but my body's doing something for me here. It, it's keeping me from tipping over because I've only decided to stand on one toe, but my body's doing all the other work. In fact. I'm not ever thinking, I'm never thinking, well, gee, I need to send more blood down there. Okay, heart, send more blood down there. Okay, nervous system, I think I need some more calf muscles, calf muscles, calf muscles, big toe, little toe, no, no, little one, little, oh, oh no. No, that's all done autonomically by my body. And that's the same way emotions are. Emotions happen in two nanoseconds. We perceive that danger and boom, our emotional systems. And diencephalon, release all the hormones to balance the body. So we're not in control of our thoughts. We're not in control of our bodily reaction. The only thing you can control is your perception of what just happened emotionally. Control causes us to try to ruminate or react. Acceptance gives us freedom to go, well, that just happened. I'm afraid. And to move on into the value section. It's the number one factor for team effectiveness, this, okay? According to research by Google, according to Amy Evanson, a Harvard researcher, she wrote the book, The Fearless Organization. Great research behind this, teaching your leaders how to perceive instead of react to emotions and helping their team to do the same helps people to feel valued. Emotional science leads to people feeling valued. That leads us to the last section here, real fast, value science. So what does value science do? It's the focusing on the future. Where are we going together as a team, as an organization? It's based on ACT and logotherapy. And it's, it's based on the future of valuing people. How are we going to live in the next few years, months, years? How are we going to be valued? Well, the number one thing is we're, we're focusing on valuing people, not just these goals. Goals are temporary stuff that we, we lead people to on a pathway, hopefully, to be valued. Okay? Goals lead to stuff and outcomes and end in time. The boom, they're done. And then what? Values lead to people forever. It's like going west. You never really get west. You just keep going, according to ACT. When valuing people becomes your vision, you will thrive, okay? So finance follows valuing people. We, we mentioned this once before. In Southwest Airlines, United tried to copy Southwest Airlines processes. Their goals had all their goals written down and copied them all, but didn't copy their values. So United was never able to quite reach where Southwest was because they didn't copy their values. 
And so here's, here's the key to values. This is super quick because we have to run through this, what usually takes me hours to give in a seminar. Creational value. That's where most organizations are stuck. They say, how many have you seen this? We create these televisions with excellence and quality, or we create this service with quality and excellence. And that's a great creational value. There's a way to measure that. There's a way to obtain that. But they don't ask, why do we do that? They don't go into the experiential values. Like, like uh, Starbucks has done this. They've gone from, like, we create great coffee, but why? Because we want people to experience a, a home away from home, a homey experience where people feel peace. That's what we want people to feel. So all their employees, all of their environments, all of their products are geared towards people feeling that. And then you need to ask one more question, the ultimate values. Why are we asking this? Why are we doing this? Ultimately, because people are the most valuable thing that our organization values. Dare I say that people are sacred and everything that we do takes on an era of that importance because the coffee serves this ultimate value. I don't just spend my life grinding grounds. I spend my life creating value for people. That's what I do every day. Imagine if every employee had a vision of every day I show up to create value for people, both my teammates, for myself, and for those I serve. Amazing difference it would make. And this was discovered by Viktor Frankl, the author of Man's Search for Meaning. In the, in the, he was a, a concentration camp victim and he entered the camp with his life's work in a, in a manuscript, but back then it wasn't saved on some hard drive. They took it and they burned it. Boom, gone. Life meaning, gone. Experiential, he gets to walk in bare feet in the snow to go dig meaningless trenches, forced labor. But he found that people that ascribe to the ultimate value, that people are valuable and that could never be taken from him, they survived and thrived even in the concentration camp. He had this amazing statement about valuing and how it can create a future for people even stuck in the worst circumstances. He said, for the first time in my life, I saw the truth that is set in song by so many poets and proclaimed by so many as the final wisdom by so many thinkers that the truth, that love, that care, that value is the ultimate and highest value to which man can aspire. And then I grasped the meaning of the greatest secret of humankind, of human poetry, human thought, and belief have to impart that the salvation of man is through love and in love, valuing people. That's what propelled him through the darkest of the night. And even our circumstances are nowhere near that dire, but work is hard. But what are we doing? What are we creating? We're valuing people. We're creating a future of that's where we're going. We're going to value people for the rest of our lives and the rest of the life of this organization. And when people feel that sense that that's where we're going, I'll go there because you're already leading them to what that right plane has already decided that's where they wanted to go. So these three scientific practices are what change leaders into super leaders. But I don't want them just to be scientific and wooden in their approach. I want them to be, this to be an art of VP culture. I want them to be virtuoso so that when they go, that coach, he changed my life. That leader in that organization, she changed my life. I'll forever be grateful for how she taught me to value others and, and, and how that experience changed me and, and opened my eyes. That's the kind of leaders we want you to have in your organization. And that's the kind of leaders that will change the emotional current of your culture towards a VP culture. And in fact, Andre Agassi at the end of his life figured this out. He says, I'm not playing for me. I'm playing for my fans. In fact, I can use the money that I make to start a charter school in Las Vegas for kids. And he ended up writing a letter to his, his, his son and saying, you know, son, never forget that life is about valuing people. It's not about winning. It's about doing your best for people every day of your life. And then I was able to tell my daughter, I didn't tell her just like, I hope, I hope you make enough money. It's all just about money. Don't worry about it. Choose the profession that makes the most or, you know, have just a big dream that'll propel you. I was just said, when you value people, whatever it is you do, your art major, sociology, whatever you want to do. If you're valuing people, it's going to be okay. And she actually joined a social work major and she's actually in the, in the Missouri National Guard now. And she wants to value people. And she knew that if it was art or whatever she would do, she would be okay. She was not in a crisis. 
And I want to leave you with this one story from Southwest Airlines as a, as a closing example of what you can create, what people create for each other in evaluating circumstances. This is a letter to Southwest Airlines that the, the chairman of the board, she wrote down. She said, dear Southwest Airlines, I'm writing to comment and gratefully acknowledge the fine service my husband and I received on one of your planes. My husband returned from Norfolk, Virginia after being deployed in Iraq for a, for a year. Our flight home from Baltimore to Long Island was the last leg of a long journey for him. This flight became an unforgettable, beautiful memory for us both. Your employee, a flight attendant named Sandra, took the time and the effort to not only thank my husband for his service, but asked everyone on the plane to do the same by allowing us to get off the plane first. As we began to exit, all the passengers clapped, thanked, congratulated. We both became crying as Sandra's detailed explanation and announcement about my husband's service in our life together. As we made it up the aisle, it was such a relief to finally believe that someone had appreciated the sacrifices that we and our children had made. As touched as we were by what went inside the plane, we were floored. That to find that your employees on the ground outside were waiting to give my husband a bottle of champagne as well as their thanks. And I was extremely touched by one of the soft Southwest employees. Another one turned to me and said, let me thank you for what must have been a year of sacrifice for us all. And as we entered the gate area, every person waiting in the gate to depart stood and applauded the safe return of a man they never knew all because of the valuing actions of your employee, Sandra. Please extend our greatest appreciation for Sandra's creation of our treasured memory that will last a lifetime. Customers, Deborah and Peter Ellison. That's what value can create. And that's what I wanted to create for you in this hour. So that when you come back to this table and, this, and the CEO turns to you and she asks you, what's your plan for culture? You could say, let me, let me get you excited about what our culture is going to be. We're, it's all about valuing people. And here are the practices we're going to do. And you'll give them the, the science and the, and the case studies to excite and ignite the hearts of every person in your organization. So that's our presentation for the day. And I hope that you are inspired to go out and create VP culture and know how to do it even more than you did before you came. So. Um, any other questions that you have, type them in the screen here and I'd be happy to connect with you guys. I'll type in here on, in the chat the URL of my, of my website. And if you go to this place slash go, um, there's, I have free PDF leadership guides that I can set you up for. So you get a PDF leadership guide. They'll help your leadership start getting through each one of these with exercises and things to do and or my newsletter and things like that. So I, we can stay connected and keep going together down this journey of creating value culture together. So any questions before we go? I know we all have busy lives and I appreciate all your time that you've took out to, to, uh, to spend with me in this hour. So back to you, uh, Katie. If you if we'll look for any questions. It looks like there's no questions in the chat. A lot of thank yous. Uh, Randall, thanks so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Wonderful yeah, appreciate the time. Chats. And everybody have a great day. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon.